My friends, the great experiment. The greatest trick, trick, trick. Hit it. Trick, trick. Would you look at that? The greatest trick, trick. And you people, you're all astronauts. Are some kind of star trick, trick. Welcome to Greatest Trek. It's a new Star Trek podcast from the makers of The Greatest Generation. I'm Ben Harrison. I'm Adam Pranica. It's pilot season, Adam. You know what that means. (laughs) I should have turned that into more of a question. (laughs) What that was is a prompt, Ben. You know what that (laughs) means, don't you? Why don't you tell me in the FODs what that means? Well, we've got a a lot of time in between now and new Star Trek coming out. And as far as I know, we're still waiting on an actual date for uh, season five of Discovery. I think we have a rough idea. So waiting for a date is something you know all about, huh? (laughs) You're telling me, brother. We're filling the time in between now and such time as the Star Trek industrial complex releases more material for us to review here on Greatest Trek. Kind of looking into the era of television that was happening sort of contemporaneous with TNG, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager. An era of television that's near and dear to both of our hearts. Mm -hmm. And checking out some of the other sci-fi franchises that came out in that era. You know, seeing how they stack up against Star Trek. The ones that we didn't choose to form a podcast about? (laughs) Yeah, I guess so. Um, Yeah, I mean, I'll be curious to see if any of them really pique my interest and make me want to watch the rest of them. Or, I mean, there are there are lots of things in today's episode to talk about where they borrowed explicitly from Star Trek and where they didn't. And so, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting project. And we're going to I think we decided we'll reveal what the next episode is going to be at the end of each episode. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's the hook. So yeah, keep it locked here on Greatest Trek for uh, the next 10 or so weeks as we uh, dig into the back catalog of uh, all kinds of weird sci-fi that uh, I never watched any of this junk. Oh, I did. I didn't have time. I wasn't allowed. I I, I was allowed an hour of TV every day, you know? (laughs) I I used that up on Star Trek. I was going to say, I I thought you used it up on PBS or something. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like the Neil Lehrer, what, who is the host of this? Oh yeah, the McNeil Lehrer News Hour was on in our house pretty much every night, and I did catch a lot of that. But yeah. I don't think that counted toward my total because that would have been, you know, my father putting that on or or whatever. Yeah, hear the the dulcet tones of Jim Lehrer <laughs> <laughs> helping dinner digest. What an era. You sort of larynched that uh, that pronunciation. It's the way he pronounces his own last name. Good evening, I'm Jim Lara. Yeah. It's great. Jim Lala's <laughs> earring is out of uniform code. <laughs> <laughs> For a news broadcast. Yeah. So, I mean, like, we've we've said it before. Some of the best Star Trek films feel very similar to submarine films. Sure. And we, we are both great lovers of the submarine film genre. And this kind of, <laughs> I mean, this should be right in the numbers for us. And I think we'll, we'll find out whether it is or isn't. Today we are reviewing a Roy Scheider vehicle. You're going to need a bigger boat. Originally aired in 1993, I believe. How old were you in 93? Eight? I was a 10-year-old boy. What about that? Mm. Yeah. And uh, this uh, this pilot was directed by Irvin Kershner, who directed Empire Strikes Back. I'm not familiar with that movie. I am familiar with RoboCop 2, which he also <laughs> directed. How about that? So uh, something we can both enjoy yeah. in his film catalog. I'm curious to, to dive in, as it were, Adam. Mm. God, it's just not going to stop, is it? <laughs> uh, let's get our feet wet, Adam. It is the Stop. pilot of uh, Sequest DSV to be or not to be. You know the greatest danger facing us is an irrational fear of the unknown. What's up? Me? I was afraid when I booted up this episode because it's opening shots, this B-roll sequence, was some of the grainiest ass, busted, (laughs) 
footage I've ever seen on a streamer, like on a streaming service. I was like, is this going to be the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is really rough. And it's not for a little while before we get our first shot in HD. They did rescan all of the, the footage from this show. How relieved were you when we finally landed on HD, though? God, it was like <laughs> a glass of cold water after walking through the desert. <laughs> yeah, because uh, it's also like really early CG crap at the beginning. Like it's it's a bunch of, you know, stock footage of manta rays and porpoises and whatnot. And JFK assassination footage? Like that was weird? <laughs> yeah. Uh, somewhat less famous Kennedy speech, somewhat less rousing when he's just talking about the salinity of our body. <laughs> it's the same as that of Earth's ocean. <laughs> we will go to the sea. A drop of human semen will land on the bosom of a broad that I bring to the Lincoln bedroom, <laughs> and that semen will have the same <laughs> salinity. Yeah. Rope salinity, a big, big part. <laughs> the beginning of this series. It's a choice, you know? <laughs> We're dropped into an environment where, like, like right away, the world has changed. There's, there's full-on, like, mining on the seafloor. There's pirates underwater. Yeah. Shooting missiles out of mini-subs in a chase scene. Like, like this is fantastic. And uh, we're in Livingston Trench, which is named after the vagina of Picard's fish. <laughs> which is a nice little callback to TNG, I think. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I suppose you're worried about your fish, too. No? <laughs> is that why that, that uh, spherical aquarium had that blurry part <laughs> in the remastered version? Yeah. Yeah. You can see everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, this is like a chase scene. There is a uh, little mini submersible getting chased by a couple of other mini submersibles. And uh, he almost hits an underwater train trying to get away from them. And uh, he bonks his noggin, gets a little blood up there on his forehead. They slam the door shut just behind his submersible and he gets away from these pirates or whatever. This is a strange cold open. He like comes aboard this underwater environment and he's like, you know, oh, wow, that was a close one. I almost died. <laughs> and there's like this worried older woman there that's like scolding him for prospecting beyond the, the boundaries of their of their claim or something. This is what happens. This is the the new frontier. Yeah. The seafloor. And out from the trench comes the sea quest what a great big ship this is yeah you don't get a real good look at it in the darkness yeah it suggests a great great size it does i mean they're in big trouble but uh, the sea quest comes to the rescue of the underwater ocean floor mining corp and uh boy what's more heroic than defending miners I mean, I, I wish there had been a sequest around uh, at the airport where they were keeping Epstein's plane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Good call. On the bridge of sequest, a bridge that is red like a Russian submarine in Hunt for Red October. Like, like it looks like a warship in there. It really does. And they've like smoked it up so that there's all this like atmosphere. We meet its captain. This is Captain Stark. And she is so fucking sick of these goddamn pirates. Yeah. Is anyone going to do anything about these pirates? Me? Just me? Aren't you tired of this game? We aim at them, they aim at us, and the whole world holds its breath. She is ready to shoot at these guys. She's so impatient. Peace sucks. We shouldn't have to wait for orders. Yeah. Let's get in there. Like, I'm the captain. How about some orders from me? My order's not good enough? The only way to secure peace is through strength, she says. And they're like waiting for word from uh, sub command or whatever. And she's got, get this, 
a black XO who wants them to wait for confirmation on their orders just in case. Amazing. I'm captain of this boat. Now shut the fuck up! Amazing how similar this scene is to our one of our favorite submarine movies, Crimson Tide. However, <laughs> where's that second set of launch keys? Yeah. This scene was driving me crazy. <laughs> Yeah. It's just Stark's keys that you need? She can just arm the nukes whenever she wants? There's no second layer of decision making? Didn't like that. Yeah. This is a bad design. It it tells the viewer this is a poorly designed submarine. Yeah. I just hope we get to meet the asshole that designed this submarine. <laughs> I know. I know. So yeah, there is a captain I have to relieve you of command scene. Very suggestive hands around a rod and then Ford's hands around her hands around that rod <laughs> in order to stop the launch. Yeah. Why do you guys use a dildo to, I mean, again, insane design decisions. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Very suggestive. Why does the ship look like it gets a stiffy when you turn the key to launch the nukes? Mr. Phillips, initiate firing sequence. It's going to take 13 months to, uh, unwind this ball and not yeah and uh we're on the united earth oceans organization training base it's just a mouthful this is something that bridger has a hard time with later on and i get it yeah admiral paris is here Mm -hmm. that was a fun little reveal nice (laughs) (laughs) he's talking to this ex show his idea is nuts like, Ford is never in line to be the captain of this ship. And Admiral Noyce is like, look, in order to get my first choice, Nathan Bridger, to be the new captain, I need you to be a fuck up. I need, I need Bridger to be convinced that he's going to save the ship from you to be its captain. I need you to embarrass the shit out of yourself. Sir, it's all in there. I got to run. Don't let me down, John. He seems pretty uncomfortable with this in a way that I think anyone would be. Yeah. Like, you wouldn't mind if this guy cut the line in front of you, right? (laughs) And in so doing, like, you had to look like an absolute ass at the same time. I mean, Admiral Noyce is, is like, you know, I know this is not an easy thing to do, and it's, like, humiliating or whatever, but I, I need you to do it. Is there any point where Admiral Noyce reassures him that like, look, man, you're great and you're going to get a command, but you need to do me a solid this one time? Like, I don't feel like that's on the table, is it? It doesn't really feel like it is. What's in it for Ford? I don't know. Yeah, it's a it's it's a weird sell. Yeah. So it is with that that we set up the idea that we're going to go meet this captain, Nathan Bridger, that Noyce believes is the only man on earth that can do the job of captaining the Sequest. And we cut to Roy Scheider, like, swimming in the Caribbean, and he's got a a great big beard, and he's hanging out with a dolphin, and a bunch of these UEOO people put down on the beach in, like, a helicopter and uh, head to his... Fish and Shack. Ben, so much of this episode is spent referring to the idea that Bridger swims naked with this dolphin. Yeah, yeah. Is he naked with this dolphin right now? Oh, man. Uh, You know, none of the nudity comes up until later, so I didn't even clock whether he was. This is an NBC show, right? I remember watching this on NBC. Yeah, well, it's on uh, it's on Peacock, so yeah. uh, that would stand to reason. I mean, this they weren't going to do an NYPD blue amount of nudity. That's ABC. Right. Yeah, you can't show crack. Would you look at that? I love the reveal where Bridger saunters into his shack, his, his beachside home. And on one angle, the angle that shoots out the door, you see the United Earth Oceans folks walk in. And it looks like a fucking seafood restaurant facing that way. It just looks like a dive. But when you reverse the shot looking back at Bridger, it's like computers (laughs) and (laughs) and lab equipment and stuff. And then you reverse the shot again and Rambo is standing there with a belt-fed machine gun getting ready to shoot those computers. We have the most advanced weapons in the world available to us. It really did look like... uh, 
the mind was the best weapon in this scene, right? <laughs> it did. Yeah, I don't know what Bridger is up to in here, but it's just as much computering as it is hanging out with fishes and stuff. He is trying to deny even being Nathan Bridger initially. Captain Bridger? Bridger. I don't know her. <laughs> it's so absurd. It doesn't seem like he's like staying up on the news. Like he doesn't know what UEOO is. Uh huh. And he's like, so is it UEOO or is it just UEO? Because all your hats just say UEO. <laughs> but then like sometimes you're calling it UEOO. Which one is it? I'm glad you brought up the hats because I think science fiction depicting future clothing often makes this mistake. They get just too weird. <laughs> especially in hats. And this yeah. is like such a familiar kind of weird looking cap that they're wearing. Like it looks plausible. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of guys in like Portland that are wearing hats that are of this design now, but mm. like we'd never seen a hat of this particular description then. Yeah. Yeah. Bridger pff, has no patience for this. He's like, you want to see a cool dolphin trick? He, he goes down to the dock. He slaps the end of it with an oar, and uh, out comes his dolphin friend. Yeah. And uh, he, he tosses a little thing to him, and he's like, hey, go put this thing somewhere else. And they have, like, a way of communicating that's mostly hand signals and, uh, like, a little bit of, I don't know, instruction, like vocal instruction. Yeah. And, and squirting out the blowhole into the face. Oh, yeah. I mean, he doesn't even have to ask for that anymore. <laughs> Darwin knows exactly what to do. All right, Darwin, my boy. Yeah, there's not like a point where Darwin is going like, mm, where do you want it? You know the routine. Oh. Ben, I got to ask you, what is happening with the sleeves of Bridger's cutoff shirt? Does anyone cut off the sleeves of their shirt the way Bridger has decided to do here? <laughs> Normally, you'd cut at the seam. Right. That's the non-chaotic choice. Yeah, you take that seam out of out of the question, and and it looks like it was always meant to be there. Bridger has cut an inch from the seam so that there's a little bit of like there's an inch of sleeve. There's a little bit of sleeve left on the shirt, and also it's like one of those like travel shirts that dads order out of a catalog that they find in the seat back on an airplane with a lot of <laughs> venting in the back. This is a $200 technical dad shirt <laughs> that he's left one inch of sleeve on. What are you doing? <laughs> you can get a sense of his level of sanity just by that choice. Yeah. So he and the Admiral go for a walk on the beach. They're having a conversation about, uh, like, come back and check out Sequest. Like, we're doing... A, a totally different thing with it. Like it was this ship of war that you designed, but like now Norpak gave it to us and now we're using it as a, as a peacekeeper. And he's, he's like, yeah, <laughs> sounds like a warship to me. <laughs> Admiral Noyce is like, look, I think it would be great if the architect of this ship were also its captain. And I also think that's what your dead wife would have wanted you to do. Nathan, you can't pass this up. For God's sakes, Carol is dead. Let it go. I won't. I don't like that angle. Like, like, you can tell that Admiral Noyce and Bridger go way back. They're friendly. They may even be friends. My closest friend, I would never do that to. <laughs> you cannot evoke dead family members in an effort to get someone to make a career decision. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he does agree to go and look at it, though. Like, that's yeah. all he'll promise. The vibe is like, I walked away from that life a long time ago, <laughs> you know. Once I saw what a dolphin could do to my junk, I left <laughs> that world behind. Once I felt the, the spray that a dolphin could get onto my face, I knew that that life was no longer for me. <laughs> you ever look at a bottle nose and just know exactly what could fit in there? <laughs> He takes the PJ out to uh, Pearl Harbor, I guess, and uh, we get some loving shots of the ship. Not too many. This is not like seeing the entrepreneur in space dock at all. The interior of this ride does not hold up under resolution scrutiny. Did you notice this? 
the interior of this cabin is fucked. Oh, you're talking about the airplane, not the... Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, that's one of those, like, this is a set. It's no longer a real airplane and, like, 10 million pornos about, like, a flight attendant fucking one of the travelers yeah. have been shot in here. It's not on screen, but I think this is an Alaska Airlines flight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But also, like, the interior of the Sequest ship itself, like, when they get on it, there's, like, underwater windows mm -hmm. and it's everything in the foreground is that like up res hd but the they did not redo the effects in hd the way they did when they remastered star trek the next generation so yeah what's in the key out the window is is still like i mean it's it's not just that it's low res but it's also still interlaced like yeah. uh it looks really bad by comparison yeah it's tough the ship is a beehive of activity and they're, you know, they're walking around, you know, he's getting a tour of this thing he designed and we get to see lots of cool hallways and, you know, different, different environments. I thought they did a really nice job on this set. Like it's, it's got some nice kind of like futuriness to it, but also feels like it's, you know, tons of pipes and hoses and high pressure water. Gauges. Tons of gauges. You must love that. <laughs> Yeah, big time. Felt good. They get in a maglev car, and <laughs> there's a very funny camera move to sell that the maglev car is actually zipping around where they just, like, dolly the camera left really hard. It's great. <laughs> when they get into it. I love it. Thank you for riding maglev. The maglev takes them to the bridge of the ship. There are these, like, great big, I guess, pressure doors, like the... Did you understand that that, like, middle spherical section when you see exteriors of the ship is where the bridge is. Yeah, and it made some logical sense to me too, right? Like all of the sections seem to have subsections yeah. inside that would protect them from whatever hull breach might happen in other sections. Yeah, so like these these big like armored doors close and then they're like all they're all like plugged up into the bridge. And this is where we get our our like loving pans around that uh we would have gotten as an exterior in a Star Trek show. It's not the sort of set that shows the whole thing in the wide shot, like the bridge of the entrepreneur. It's got all these distinct sections in different areas. Like, I don't think you ever get a wide shot of it where you see the whole thing. No, no. There's tons of stuff in there that never gets used in this pilot. Like, there's that thing when you go to a video game arcade and there's a dirt bike game where you actually like ride on the bike and there's two of those in the bridge. Right. And it's like, I don't know. I don't know what that is. We never return to that spot. Dude, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely like there is technology this show is interested in and that isn't it right now. Yeah. The greatest trek is yet to come. To come, to come. So we smash cut to Jamaica and we meet kind of our our big bad guy, the puppet master of the whole thing, the head of Le Chien Industries. Ben, what mean Le Chien in French? <laughs> the dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. George the dog is what this man's name is. And he is mad that all of the treaties that established the UEO have cut him off from underwater mining concessions that he previously had access to. And what does peace and harmony have to do with business? He was going to be wealthy beyond the dreams of avarice, but is no more because of this. So uh, in order to fight back, he has come up with a plan to destroy the Sequest submarine. The guy who plays Lichian is Michael Parks, and he's just got the perfect bad guy face. Yeah. <laughs> I don't feel like they had a lot of confidence in his casting, though, because they really bulk up the other bad guy qualities to him, like the chalice that he drinks out of. Yeah. And the being surrounded by ponytailed henches. Like, <laughs> yeah. I think he's doing well enough without these embellishments, but he's a 10 out of 10 bad guy. And hey, what's Captain Stark doing there? Yeah. <laughs> Stark is here, and she's been hired to be the captain of a pirate submarine that Le Chien Industries is going to be putting to sea with the goal of destroying the Sequest. And uh, 
he promises Captain Stark that she will be very rich if she is able to accomplish this goal for him. Captain Stark is so mad. (laughs) We've watched a lot of TV over a lot of years. Yeah. It's hard to remember anyone being this angry for this long. I know. Like the full runtime of this episode, she's absolutely rip shit. 13 months later, she's still 10 (laughs) out of 10 pissed and she maintains how pissed she is for the whole episode. Amazing. (laughs) If I'm George Leshien, like, sure, Stark is qualified, but, like, it kind of seems like she's going to be a problem, right? (laughs) It really does. You don't get the sense that his fail son is is jealous either. Like, come on, Dad, why can't I be captain? Like, there's none of that. He is, like, the perfect mirror to to Commander Ford, right? Like, he he is, like, the XO that, should have been given command, but like nobody offered him command. He didn't ask for it, and he's fine with that. Yeah. Really black and white difference there mm. between the two of them. You're black on one side and white on the other. I am black on the right side. We sort of cut back just like in media, loving panning shots around the bridge to Sequest, where Roy Scheider is still there, kind of like kicking the tires on the ship and walking around and getting a sense of what the different things are. Mm -hmm. The triumphant music has not stopped playing. I'm starting to think maybe it's being piped into the bridge, like everybody's listening to it. If you're doing a pilot episode of a thing, the tour of the vehicle is like an essential quality to that story, and this is it. Yeah, I think over the next 10 weeks, we're going to see a lot of these. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, we meet uh, a couple more people. We meet security chief Crocker, the kind of chicken fried old buddy of the captains. Well, they really scraped the bottom of the barrel for the crew this time, didn't they? Yeah, from the looks of things, they did a little digging beneath that old barrel, too, huh? Isn't he the Argyle of Sequest? He really has Biff Yeager energy, yeah. Yeah, and he knows Bridger from way back. Yeah, they're, they're old buddies. We also meet Commander Hitchcock, who is the chief engineer. You know, she's like, gets in that embarrassing thing of like not realizing who she's talking to when she's like trying to kick the guy with the visitor badge away from her station. Her character's hair also seems permanently wet, like throughout <laughs> the entire episode. But like she took a shower like an hour ago and it's still a little wet. Not, yeah. not like... She yeah, didn't exactly. just get out of the pool. Yeah. You know? It's a great look for someone who works underwater. Yeah. I, I mean, easy maintenance, right? You just walk through one of those hatches where there's a little water dripping down from the top, which mm-hmm. seems to be mm-hmm. a thing on this ship to remind us we're underwater, I guess. We walk into what used to be the missile prep room, and that's been replaced with a bunch of science stuff happening and a dolphin habitat that includes Darwin. They took Darwin. Without asking. He's basically been abducted. This is my dolphin. Well, I thought you'd enjoy having him on board. Well, you thought wrong. So are you telling me that Bridger was convinced to fly private and in a totally different private jet? (laughs) They put Darwin in a tank and then they beat Bridger to the ship. Yeah, I think that, I mean, maybe they like put him up in a nice hotel in Honolulu for a little bit before he had to hit Pearl. You got to slow Bridger down. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, you're in? Cool. Are you sure you don't want to think about that a little bit more? (laughs) I know we worked really hard to convince you, but now that, whoa, I was not expecting that. Okay. (laughs) What if he'd been like, hey, that's my dolphin. That's Darwin. And they'd been like... That is not Darwin. That like, are you saying that all dolphins look the same to you? Like, yikes. I'll prove to you it's my Darwin. <laughs> Zip. You know the routine. Only my Darwin would do this. Nobody sprays on my face like that. Only Darwin. <laughs> oh, we get to to meet Lucas, the Jonathan Brandis character here, and the uh, the Wesley Crusher of the show. Yeah, this is very much what if Wesley, but self-possessed and and like trying to be cool, like. But with some real differences here, like Jonathan Brandis is great looking and not annoying. Yeah. 
And like already like doing stuff on the ship. Like he yeah. has programmed this thing where the ship can translate what Darwin says into kind of like a cutesy cartoon voice. What? And you know, he kind of like fucks with the captain. He's like, I heard you were trying to invent something similar and couldn't. Well, I guess I'm smarter than you. You think they auditioned different voices for the dolphin? <laughs> <laughs> Bridger friend <laughs> Bridger play with my penis <laughs> Play with my hard dolphin penis Bridger Bridger always swim naked Bridger not appropriate work friend Bridger spread those cheeks wide For Darwin <laughs> Darwin fucks Bridger's mouth <laughs> <laughs> and Rice Jider's like, I think you got some problems with your translation algorithm. <laughs> Jonathan Brandis is like, no, that was accurate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I kind of wish we got a less horny dolphin on the ship, to be honest. Yeah, but the dolphin is the horniest, you know. <laughs> this is a ship with a cetacean ops with actual cetaceans in it, Adam. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> we meet the XO. Uh, <laughs> I'm having a comedy flashback to Darwin. <laughs> <laughs> so they throw a couple of flashlights in the pool for Darwin and uh, and move on. <laughs> and the water just fucking boils as soon as they do that. <laughs> you know, we get uh, Roy Scheider kind of kicking the tires on this XO. And he's like, you know, trying to have a polite conversation or whatever and puts his hand on a bulkhead and realizes that the ship is moving. Uh-oh. This is a whole jam up. I do not like this. They fucking tricked him. They're heading out to sea. They didn't tell him. And the XO is like, okay, well, we can like put you in a launch and send you back to Pearl once we're out in open water, but that's going to be in a little while. So, uh, you know, just hold your horses. Bridger didn't pack for this. No. I'd be upset too. Yeah. My dop kit's in the hotel. <laughs> and my dolphin's dop kit is back in the Caribbean. God, that dolphin dop kit's going to be like a fucking duffel bag. <laughs> Full of lube. <laughs> Full of lube and rubbers. Darwin doesn't use rubbers. Darwin wants to... <laughs> Feel it. <laughs> like sushi, Darwin likes it raw. In the meantime, Bridger gets taken to some quarters, which turn out to be the captain's quarters. Yeah. Hits a couple buttons on the remote. This is the first thing you do in any hotel room, right? Grab the remote, turn on the TV. Yeah. Look at that. Mario Lopez. <laughs> Oh, this is so aggravating. <laughs> What's the button just to get like, you know, Discovery Channel or whatever? I don't want to watch this. I know enough about San Diego, all right? Like, <laughs> I don't need to know what movie's premiering this month. I am aware that there is a spa in the hotel that was well established on the website when I booked the room. I love the little magic trick they do with the gassy hologram, which is yeah. on the reverse shot. They depict the back of this hologram person's head. Isn't that neat? It's super fun. Yeah, and this is like actually being projected on the gas, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a practical effect in the room. And it's William Morgan Shepard here to tell Roy Scheider that he is in fact a prisoner on this ship. Work well, and you will be treated well. Work badly. And you will die. There is no electronic frontier. There is, wow. you know. The balls and so yeah. forth. <laughs> I do have an off button, if you will. <laughs> if he wants to get off, he can, but they're 5,000 feet below sea level. Survival on the surface is impossible. Amazing cameo here. Yeah, it's great. And uh, he's sort of like this holographic AI that's been installed to be the ship's captain's confidant. Here to provide a sounding board in times of moral or ethical conflict. 
It's too bad every room doesn't have this, though. Yeah. Just this one room. You got to go home to talk to your hollow confidant. Mm -hmm. They get to talk, and, and we cut over to the Delta Four pirate sub, which is underway under the command of Captain Stark. And uh, one thing that's very clear cutting around this sub is that uh, you get to have a cool ponytail if you work on the pirate sub. It looks like it goes down just past your butthole. Hey! Who parked on the sidewalk? I know that you're not going to get this reference, but for literally everyone else, <laughs> there was an era in baseball where, like, the Yankees weren't allowed to have facial hair. Or I know that the Yankees weren't allowed to have facial hair. This seems like Stark is doing that, like, marred shot thing in the Cincinnati Reds. Like, she's got qualifications <laughs> for who can be on this ship. And if you don't have a ponytail, you can get the fuck out. Yeah, yeah. You got to be cool. I think overall, Irvin Kirshner did a great job directing this pilot. But um, I didn't like that she was sitting down when she delivers her, like, by all means, Mr. Maxwell line. Like, they're talking about, like, weapon systems and getting them online, and they're going to go, like, shoot some innocents right now. Yeah. But she's, like, side-sitting in an office chair when she delivers it. And what this moment calls for is her standing, like, arms akimbo on the bridge, like, you know, camera, like, pushing up into into her as she musters the resolve to go do, like, a objectively terrible thing. It's hard because... Like, this is the way she's written. Like, this is not a Shelly Hack problem. Right. This is a as-written problem. Yeah. And she can do nothing else but take scenery off of the wall and just chew it up. That's the only tool she has left in her tool chest. Yeah. So we cut back to Sequest, where Roy Scheider is, like, chewing out Admiral Noyce on FaceTime. How shocked were you that... Noyce didn't just launch the ship. He wasn't even on the ship when it launched. He got off the ship. He, he Were like, you confused by this? I just assumed that Noyce was on the ship and he just ordered it away. He made an excuse like, oh, I got to go do some paperwork and got the fuck off the boat. <laughs> Probably better that he did because I think Bridger would have killed him. Yeah. Yeah. The level of deception that Admiral Noyce is capable of is... Uh, Something to keep an eye on if you're going to go forward and watch the rest of this series. <laughs> like, he is giving, like, early TNG Starfleet Admiral deceptiveness energy. Good call. Yeah, absolutely. Ford finds Bridger in the hydroponics lab. That checks out, right? Mm. That's where you'd want to go first. <laughs> so what are, we, what are we growing in this grow up? Yeah. Is Swiss chard the same thing? As rhubarb, I uh, I got some gummies a little while ago that were called Swiss chard. Like there's mm. a, I think that's just a, a a name. Oh, okay, I got you, I got you. So uh, he's checking out the op, and uh, the doctor runs up to Commander Ford, and she's fucking rip shit about the situation with military people using the laboratories to like set their shit up. And she does not like it. They get in this whole argument back and forth. We learn a lot about the ship's complement here. There's uh, a, a lot more scientists than there are military people on board. And there are parts of the ship that are dedicated to science. And Commander Ford definitely like a, this is a ship of war first and foremost. And the science shit is secondary mindset. So he, he really pushes back on her. This is very amusing to Roy Scheider. I really like Dr. Westphalen, medicine woman. Mm -hmm. I think she is interesting right away. I think there is an interesting romantic potential between her and Roy Scheider's character. I think that much is clear. Yeah, I was glad that she wasn't like a girlfriend from the academy that he dated right. before his wife died or something. Yeah, like Roy Scheider's in the corner, like tugging at his collar, like, <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I really got to get out of here. <laughs> and then further back in the shot, Darwin is watching from one of his little like swim through the ship tubes and he's tugging at his dick like, ah, oh, yeah. I want to watch. Pieces of dolphin fleshlight like floating. 
<laughs> on the surface. <laughs> Just torn apart. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the reasons she is attractive to the Roy Scheider character is that like she rides on the same level that he does. Like she is anti-military, pro-science, kind of resents any military presence on the ship at all. Right. I think it is her pitching a fit in this scene that helps create a permission structure in his mind for making the decision he ultimately does. Yeah. Because that is his big hang up is like he does not want to go back to, uh, you know, he, he beat his swords to plowshares a long time ago, man. I think it's big that she states the numbers too, because like you could say this is a science ship, but in practicality, it could be run by the military and there could be a hundred military folks and 20 lab rats. But like she says that there are more of her kind than there are of Ford's kind. Yeah. Which is not racist, I promise. (laughs) She's talking about the science. Don't you dare take that out of context. We got one more key character to introduce in this episode. It's Ben Krieg, the supply and morale officer, the Neelix of the ship, if you will. Sure. He is also the chief engineer lady's ex. They were married for a bit. Only for a year. Seemed like a good idea at the time. He got tired of those wet pillows. (laughs) She's always sleeping in the wet spot, huh? Yeah. You think that's what broke up the marriage? I don't know. Sleep incompatibility is a big thing. Yeah, it really is. Hey, Lieutenant Krieg, maybe don't do the thing where you bring up the captain's dead son, like, in your first interaction. Why does this keep happening to Bridger? Like... (laughs) evoking the memories of his dead family members that's really sensitive stuff yeah you gotta be careful about that i mean in ben krieg's defense he does feel like he knows captain bridger like don't say that either yeah like i mean that's a parasocial relationship ben you don't really know him you know you know what you've been told about him yeah i can tell you're very interested in him whatever happened to that pirate sub yeah We find out next where it has rolled up on the Gedrick power station and it starts shooting. Yeah. And on the Sequest bridge, they get the distress call from this incident. Why is Bridger even there? He's the ranking officer. What? Yeah. It's so weird. You think he's just a dad on a tour with a visitor badge, but like, no, his rank actually has some pull. Yeah. This is, I mean, I think that there's also like a thing with Commander Ford that they really try to beat into you over the course of this pilot, that this guy knows the fucking rule book front to back and back to front. Yeah. And uh, regulations say that you alert the senior officer. And that's like, he's like, take my command, please. Like, (laughs) yeah, he really wants Roy Scheider to do this. And like, you wonder all through this, like that fight between the head scientist lady and Commander Ford earlier, I was wondering, like, was that something that they planned ahead of time for Roy Scheider's benefit? Yeah, I was on the watch for that, too. Is this a scene that they planned for his benefit? Like, they're trying to trick him into taking the captain role here. Ford is so subtle. Like, I kept waiting for the, like, when is the moment where he's going to, like, really trip and fall and perform as the dipshit that the Admiral wanted him to be. And to his credit, like, he never really does that. Yeah, he's never like, duh, duh, duh. It's a lot subtler than that. Mm -hmm. I mean, speaking of the the impression you just did, dun, dun, dun is the cliffhanger. (laughs) (laughs) Because when Bridger takes command of this ship, we're in a to-be-continued frame. We sure are. I don't know if these aired together originally or what. Did you read anything about that? This feels like a special television event. Yeah, it really does. We need to score a lot of black fast. My licensed businessman. Well, there's a new ship. You treat her like a lady. You treat her like a lady. She'll always bring it home. We are going to jump right into part two here. We get to see the D4 pirate ship as it like runs up on the station. And we've learned that this ship has these scanners called whiskers that are, I guess like independent little drones that hover outside of it. Like every time you see an exterior, there's, there's the 
submarine, and then there's all, all these like lights kind of hovering around it, and, and mm-hmm. those are the whiskers. So you get to see kind of like blurry representations. It's not all sonar blips from the bridge of this ship. Yeah, it gives you like the B-roll that bookends this episode. Yeah. Like that kind of resolution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very similar. So they beat to quarters right at the beginning of this second part. And we get to see them like locking the ship down. One guy like slipping through the the bulkheads as they're closing. I think we learned that they're like about 20 minutes away from the target. So they are rushing to get there before this uh, Delta Four pirate ship does anything bad. Did we already talk about what the inside of Lucas's apartment looks like? No, we should talk about that because uh, when when we're cutting around the ship as they're closing up all the doors and everything, Lucas is <laughs> reading Playpen magazine. You look at this angle and he's got it open so Darwin can see, right? They're both <laughs> reading porno together, aren't they? And what's going on here seems pretty pervy, doesn't it? Lucas is like, you're not the horny character. I'm the horny character on this show. Darwin done with this page. Turn the page. <laughs> Open centerfold. Darwin want to see everything. <laughs> Darwin water cloudy. Cloudy water for Darwin. <laughs> it's a bad time for the Sequest controls to be on the fritz, right? Because yeah. uh, that gives a much smaller, much less powerful sub the advantage. You would think on paper... Sequest is going to blow this thing out of the water. Not the case. I mean, Bridger's going around, like, trying to raise their defenses, trying to shoot torpedoes. Nothing's working. Was this for Bridger's benefit? Like, you never quite get any resolution. Like, you get resolution on some of it, but this was not one of the things that you got resolution on. And they take it, like... The the power station gets hit. It, pr- presumably, a lot of civilians get killed when that happens. The bangers rip the porno right out of uh, Jonathan Brandis' hand. Yeah, but they fall in the water, and Darwin's pretty happy about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, they have to think quick to get the hell away from the Delta Four submarine. This is the moment where I couldn't tell if Ford was acting because of what noise ordered him to do or not that that moment where ford freezes yeah and he's like super sweaty could admiral noise order him to be sweaty yeah how much power does admiral noise have <laughs> i mean in addition to the torpedoes and and other systems on the ship is is the hvac on the fritz seems like maybe it is so yeah. uh The idea that Captain Bridger has is like flood the ballast tanks and we'll go like super duper deep, deeper than the Delta IV can go. Let's see how bad they want us. Take it to the bottom, please. Captain, this ship wasn't designed for a crash dive. You have any better ideas? I'm wide open. Stark is trying to chase them, but uh, cannot pursue. Yeah, their their ship's too little and its crush depth is, uh, is much, much higher. Yeah. So we get a conversation in that like former missile prep room between Captain Bridger and Commander Ford. This is the scene where Ford starts to admit that he and the Admiral have known about these evil forces in the water for a long time. This pirate ship's been out there. This group of pirates even has been a problem for a long time. And like the thinking was that the threat of pirates would be sufficient enough to convince Bridger that, you know, he as captain could do so much so much more good than what it was doing when it was inside Darwin the Dolphin. <laughs> Why don't you get out here in the open water and yeah. shoot some torpedoes, Captain? But like the danger of this, like all of these systems malfunctions and stuff, that was not part of the scripted plan. We didn't intend yeah. for this manipulation to be uh, deadly in the way that it, it's unfolded. The pirates hadn't been, hadn't been going this hard so far. Yeah. It had just been like stealing stuff, basically. So mm-hmm. he's like, anyways, like, I'm sorry I acted like I was bad at this. I'm actually good at this. And Darwin pops out of the tank and is like, like that you can act. Can you, can you a- act like we have never met? Darwin finds that hot. Can you act that 
<laughs> I'm here to fix the cable. <laughs> and you are someone who cannot pay for cable repair. Darwin know that a tricky role to play because Darwin not have opposable thumb, but Darwin think it would be very fun. <laughs> On the pirate ship, in addition to like the threat that the pirate ship poses to innocent folks, the captain of that ship really wants to kill some innocent people here specifically in yeah. order not just to draw Sequest out of the trench, but because she just loves it. She loves the idea of it. She wants to do it. It gives her pleasure. It's love of the game. Yeah. I mean, you got to feel for her, right? She's been the captain of a submarine before, and mostly what you're trying to do is not fire the torpedoes if you're the captain of the submarine. Like, yeah. firing the torpedoes is the last thing you want to do or you're supposed to want to do anyways, but it's got to just be like, oh, they're right there. We have torpedoes. You think anyone gets on the bridge in one of these submarines and just like stares at the gauges for fun? You know what kind like, you'd have to be a real sick fuck to want to do that for any length yeah. of time. I like firing torpedoes at innocent people. It's just what I like. <laughs> Call me crazy. Call me a pervert. We have a big meeting about this power station, the first thing that got attacked. It's a bigger problem than originally anticipated. This power station has been damaged in such a way that, like, the source of its power is now uncontained. That source, a steam vent from a volcano. Yeah. It goes without saying this is an underwater volcano, right? Do I need to say that? They need to figure that out because there's, like, you know, gas and, and nasty chemicals that were contained and are now coming out. This is all... Uh, something that we learned because Commander Hitchcock goes into hyper reality, which is like reality, but like way better. It's reality with Oakley's. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's like that time Jordy had to send that space probe down to the ship his mom was on, basically. Yeah. But it didn't like haunt her mind. She connects her Oakley's and her two power gloves to an undersea robot dog. <laughs> that dog paddles into this damaged section of the station. I'm just shocked that Darwin didn't want to fuck this thing. Yeah. There is a, a McLaughlin group where they discuss this. Issue one. Kind of a dispute breaks out again between the scientist lady and Commander Ford about like what to do next. Fight the Delta Four or fix the power station. And uh, this is where Roy Scheider actually cites chapter and verse to Commander Ford. He's like, well, we got to deal with this ecological thing because that's in the charter. We can't just like ditch these people. Yeah. Yeah. So this is an interesting development. We're going to use this as a ship of peace first, and then we can go use it as a ship of war. The greatest trick. Bridger suspects that all of these shipwide issues aren't just, they're not his design, man. That's not something that he programmed. It's not his yeah. fault, all right? What he thinks it is, is sabotage. I think we need someone to go down into the guts of her computers and dig around a bit. Westphalen suggests that uh, Lucas would be a great person to investigate the idea of there being a computer virus on the ship. And this scene that follows is like made for a general audience that does not know about computers, that does not know <laughs> about computer viruses. Because the yeah. way this is described and the names being thrown around here are great. The sound effects too, right? Because Jonathan Brandis' character is like, oh, this is a bad one. But when I try to fix it, it's protected by dogs. Computer <laughs> dogs. And you hear like the little computer dog barks. Whoa. Yeah. It's great. Whoa, what? It's got dogs. Dogs? Watch dogs. I don't know that much about computers. When I see a scene like this, I suspect that it's not just written for a general audience that doesn't know anything about computers, but by a general audience that doesn't know anything about computers. That is a great distinction. Like, I think the challenge for a lot of screenwriters is like, I know this is an element to the story that is crucial, but I don't have the subject matter expertise to do it. So I'm just going to TK, 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 TK it and like come back and, and fill it up later. Yeah. That kind of feels like what this is. 
there's some stuff in here that I was like, isn't that how anything works? Yeah. I don't know. That's not how any of this works. Darwin's out the window like, this bores Darwin. <laughs> Break out the porno. <laughs> Go into private browsing mode. <laughs> Did someone say doggy? <laughs> So uh, up on the bridge, they get a distress call from the innocent farmers that the Delta Four have gone off to kill. And uh, it seems like they are on a underwater station that is like on fire and rapidly deteriorating. And <laughs> Captain Bridger is like, that's bait. We can't just like run and, and help them in, until the boat is up and running fully. And boy, like... We got away from those farmers for a long time. It does not seem like that emergency is like something that needs to be dealt with today specifically. <laughs> Did it surprise you in a show made about and set inside submarines and and underwater bases and stuff? How little water there was? No water? There's never a moment where we're, we cut to that farming station and like the water levels rising. Yeah. Or even like up to their boots or whatever. Yeah, it looked like fire and smoke in there. The threat of drowning should be ever present, and it's completely absent from this show. There's like that one moment where like a ton of water came through the wall in the in the like we just got hit by a torpedo scene, mm -hmm. which I was excited about because I was like, okay, like now we're talking. Let's seal some folks into some compartments. Somebody's going to get zoned here, yeah, and yeah. they all make it out of that compartment. I guess they're saving that for not the first episode. Because, like, once you do that, right, like, that's, like, a big moment for any submarine thing. Are we so grizzled as submarine film and television enthusiasts that we're rooting for water at this point? <laughs> kind of feels that way. <laughs> Darwin liked to watch when life sort of snuff out of person. <laughs> Oh, Darwin. Oh, no. Darwin Dabble in Necro. <laughs> Darwin's just wearing sea cucumbers around. <laughs> Captain Bridger has a, another talk with his hologram best friend about, you know, the death of his wife and son. Did you get a little bumped in an episode that is at least a little bit about a computer virus doing a lot of damage. How credible this computer therapist might be in this scene. Yeah. And to what extent some manipulation might be happening. Like, that's off the table. But I was I was looking out for that big time. What is this guy going to make Bridger do? And it's like they didn't think of that. Like, yeah. you cut from the scene about the virus to this guy claiming to be the mainframe. Yeah. And... Captain Bridger puts on his, his uniform, heads to the bridge. God, he looks good in this thing. He really does. It really helps. I think this might even be the reason for those fucked up sleeve cutoffs earlier. Like, you gotta start Roy Scheider low in just some fucking dumpy ass shorts, flip flops, and that weird cutoff shirt, and then put him into something that is like this tailored jumpsuit and uh, and turtleneck combo. Yeah. Like, the difference between those two is massive. It really is. Like, we've we've seen a total transformation now. Like, no more scraggly beard, no more farmer tan. He is, he is buttoned up. He takes off his glasses and... Woogada, woogada. <laughs> he is hot! Want to take Bridger to prom. Oh, my God. Puts on those high heels and comes down the stairs. Yeah. Really nice. <laughs> Speaking of the bends, the mood on the uh, pirate ship, way different than the mood on Sequest. <laughs> Stark is having to answer a bunch of bullshit questions, like getting a bunch of lip from this, this crew of ponytails. Yeah. You're guns for hire and you're like questioning me? I understand, but I think you should explain it to them. This crew, as you call it, isn't the first crew to question me, but it will be the last. She breaks this picture frame that she's got, and the ponytail guy should be like, you packed your quarters with these personal items. Why are you breaking all of your things? Yeah, why, like, why bring it if you're just going to break it? I just want to say I'm starting to feel a little unsafe under your command. 
Are you just like trying to make a bunch of plausible crap for us to stuff in a torpedo tube to shoot out to like give people on the surface the sense that our ship has been destroyed? Oh, that's good strategy. Yeah, that's that's the best strategy when you're a submarine commander. It don't get much prettier than that. Was that a thing in Gages, your your submarine video game? The junk shot? Yeah. I don't recall. I was too focused on the gauges, man. Yeah, yeah. I don't blame you. They're scintillating. <laughs> you know, those diesel engines are finicky. <laughs> <laughs> you know, watch out for that oil pressure rise. We learned from Jonathan Brandis that the virus was put onto the ship 13 months ago. Huh. Hmm. Interesting. And Stark is now pregnant? <laughs> Still pregnant? <laughs> She's in it pretty deep into her fifth trimester. <laughs> that baby's going to be overcooked. <laughs> no wonder she's upset. One of their little mini subs has uh, averted the ecological disaster at the uh, power station, and we get another McLaughlin group. Issue two. Where Roy Scheider puts a wooden shoe on the desk. Hence the word sabotage. Tells them about the look into the saboteur that he's been doing. Turns out Stark, Marilyn was probably behind it. She's good. She should be. I taught her. Oh, dear. Safe to say 0% surprised by this revelation? Yeah. I kind of wanted there to be some tension between Bridger and Ford about, like, you relieved your previous commander of command. You're not going to do that to me, you know? It was so obvious that I looked past it. I was like, you know, Krieg's got a squirrely looking face. Like, uh, I kind of thought it might have been him. <laughs> yeah. Really? It's the most obvious choice? Yeah, it was her. Hmm. I mean, like, wet hair usually telegraphs bad guy in the 90s, too. <laughs> like, And she's the chief engineer, but it wasn't her. Ask anyone who's ever been fired from any job in the last 30 years. They turn off your badge. Like, <laughs> you get escorted out with your bank box. Stark was just permitted to roam around the ship sabotaging things before she left? Maybe there was like a dead man switch on the virus. Like she installed it when she came aboard and then she had to like push a button every day to keep it from going active. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I mean, Bridger is just seen as a, a huge intellect in this scene. Wow, he cracked the case. Yeah. Amazing. That, that, that is now your chair. There's this whole montage where, like, they come up with the idea, like, the virus is going to be a problem for a while, but we can kind of, like, go around it. So, presumably, they're, like, patch cabling stuff. And I loved some of the some of the moments. Like, there's, like, a membrane that they have to cut through, and then they pull out a bundle of cables, and that's got goo going through it. That's just so futuristic. I love that shit. You start putting goo in your cables... Yeah, and then how are they going to get those cables back together? They're, like, the goo fell out. I know. It seems impossible. Yeah. It seems like the sort of ship repair that you can't, that actually does more damage than fixes. Yeah, they get it fixed, and uh, we learn that the colonists are, are getting hammered again. So it's time to head out. But first, they get on FaceTime with Marilyn Stark. They, like, cut into the signal that she's supposed to be receiving from the shore. And Captain Bridger reveals himself to her. Not in the way that Darwin want. <laughs> I was really bumped in this scene because of how long it took Stark to realize that Bridger was on Sequest. Even though Bridger is wearing a jumpsuit that says Sequest on it <laughs> and is in a room that looks very Sequesty. Yeah, yeah. A room that Stark should be very familiar with. As its previous commanding officer. Yeah, she's. Th that was her room. <laughs> I. D <laughs> <laughs> Has Stark, like, or is this a scene that is meant to emphasize how badly Stark has lost her mind? She 
has totally lost it. She's like, I kill for power, you kill for peace. What's the difference? <laughs> it's totally unhinged. Yeah, she is a, a real mustache twirling baddie. Was this just a simpler time? Like, I am so used to bad guys having an ethos, man. You know, but there's like, Stark is just chaos and just murder. She's, yeah, she, I mean, she's doing it for the money, I guess. But yeah. Um, no, I mean, she told Lechienne that she's doing it because she wants to make Sequest pay. She wants to make them suffer. She wants to sink that ship. Like, yeah, the money guess, was a part of the conversation, but that's not the motivator. It's just a fringe benefit. Yeah. So they can't get a firing solution on her ship because of the virus. So Captain Bridger runs down to the Darwin tank, which seems nuts because there's like a place for Darwin to stick his head out right there on the bridge. I know. But they go all the way down to the tank and they put Darwin in like a dolphin scuba apparatus. Darwin is going to go put like a magnetized transponder on the hull of the Delta Four, and they're going to be able to get the torpedo to like home in on that. And there's some back and forth with the chief scientist lady about whether this is like ethical or okay to ask of a dolphin. Darwin's pretty enthusiastic about helping. Darwin, Darwin. I might hear what it is first. Darwin want to tear that ass apart too. Darwin told he get great reward if success. <laughs> Not just blast on face, maybe blast inside. The Darwin stuff is so of its time, but like the sadness I can't help but feel for a, a dolphin in captivity. Like I'm so impressed by this, this dolphin's performance throughout the episode. Like, holy shit. Look at all that neat stuff he's doing. Yeah. Like swimming in the background of scenes, like as they play out, as people walk down the hallways and stuff. Like, Yeah, because I don't think we said it. Like this, the idea of the ship is that Darwin can go to any room. Like there are little tank tubes everywhere. So it's like a hamster habitat for a dolphin. It's so neat on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's so fucking tragic Yeah, that this is his life. So if you can possibly suspend that and enjoy... <laughs> Darwin's sexual proclivities to get through this. Yeah. That's what happens. You are going to fire him out of a torpedo tube. No, he is going to swim out of a torpedo tube. Darwin goes into any tube, like <laughs> birthday or anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> so they, uh, they get the thing on the Delta Four, and they, they hit the Delta Four. There's like some shit where they're like opening all their torpedo tubes to make Stark think that they've got a more capable ship than they actually do. I like that. That delays her because she tries to open all her torpedo tubes. There's a little like head faint when it seems like the torpedo has lost its uh, its telemetry, but then it reacquires and it gets her. Smile, you son of a Man, does she have a fucking meltdown when everybody's trying to flee the bridge of her How do you direct Shelly Hack in this scene? I really feel like it's it's just like, look, we're gonna do this first take as big as possible, and then we'll maybe just kind of pull back in subsequent takes. And maybe they just kept the first one. I don't know what is more than this. It is the most. She's doing the most. Is she beating her crew? She's like hitting guys with like a pipe. Yeah. <laughs> She's one of those pipe hitting captains that you hear about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the ship goes down. I guess like all of the other pirates get rescued. We find this out because Le Chien is notified that uh, they don't know where she is, but his son has been saved. I thought he was dead. I thought he gets told that his pony-tailed fail son is dead. Oh, really? Yeah. My son. We don't know. He lost the sub, but Stark and the escape lifeboat are gone. Right. But, I mean, maybe pony-tailed fail son is on that lifeboat. 
with Stark. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, this is going to give Le Chien a lot to be pissed about going forward. Yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe Stark will reappear later in the series as well. Who knows? Wow. Can only hope. Yeah. So a uh, little attaboy moment with Commander Ford and Captain Bridger. And Captain Bridger goes uh, back to his apartment to scan a picture of his wife and uh, and upload it into the hollow thing for a nice wank. <laughs> I wanted her to be like, open her mouth and be like, nice to see you, Nathan. (laughs) Like uh, Jonathan Brandis couldn't get the voice part to work. (laughs) It's just always going to be that voice. (laughs) In these quarters, there are no pants, (laughs) no underwear. (laughs) In the shower, the great frontier. (laughs) The only way to survive is by following this (laughs) J-O-I. It's interesting that uh, Jonathan Brandis gets to invite himself into the captain's quarters for the end of this episode. Yeah. And he kind of has the inspirational outshot to the thing. Like Bridger's hung up on this promise he made to his dead family members. And Lucas is like, uh, yeah, my parents also did that whole promise thing and they were fucking miserable so when they got divorced finally it was great for them so is that inspiring in any kind of way for you <laughs> you weren't in here about to jack it were you i kind of got nothing to do i'm i'm like the kid on the ship I've got no friends oh man you pitched a tent in your pants camp i'm sorry man i shouldn't have, i shouldn't have barged in like this yeah so they bookend the b-roll from the very beginning of the first half of this episode and that's it That's your pilot, Ben. Yeah. A TV series with the bold vision of the future that predicts that the Miami Marlins will win the World Series in 2010. Did you like this episode? I mean, I would have bet on that. (laughs) Did you like this pilot, I should ask, Adam? She'll always bring it home. I did... With some caveats. Like, the dolphin thing is bad. Didn't like the dolphin thing. Love Roy Scheider. God, he's great. Here's maybe the thing that that I wanted to interrogate a little bit. The idea of the reluctant captain. Like, Mm -hmm. the greatness of a captain by virtue of their reputation and the idea that they don't want to command you. Very specifically. Right. I think that's such a strange quality, especially when you compare this to Star Trek captains. Star Trek captains want to be captain. Star Trek captains work very hard to get there. They have a way of being that is so different from Bridger in that way. Like, it takes so long for him to finally come around to the idea. Unclear whether or not he'll ever be comfortable doing this. But if I'm a subordinate... I don't know if I want to be captained by someone who isn't really sure they want to be. And I wonder to what extent there's a tension throughout the show that continues about that. Yeah. But I think the part that makes it feel so safe is Scheider as an actor. You never feel like you're going to be in danger even though he's a reluctant captain. You're going to be fine. He's Roy Scheider. Yeah. Like, he's so great. I think if you're going to hitch a show onto a star... It's hard to do better than this one in this subject matter. Like, he's just aces. He really is. I remember watching and liking the show and, and watching and liking the whole series. I remember next to none of it. Yeah. But um, this is a, a fun rewatch for me. What about you? It was a fun... I mean, I'd seen, like, little scraps of this show, and I was always super curious about it. Because, like, when I was a kid, I, I was perhaps... Uh, stereotypically like i would like tell people i wanted to be a marine biologist when i grew up because i was fascinated by the ocean and this was right in the numbers for me especially as a kid like it is star trek in the sea that is the pitch of this show and i think this is a really interesting pilot i feel like there's some stuff in it that's uneven and a little clunky and some stuff that doesn't age super well but um, interesting crew, interesting dynamics, and I would definitely watch more of this. I, I thought it was cool and interesting. Yeah. 
it made me remember that uh, Michael Ironside becomes the captain of Sequest in later seasons. Whoa. <laughs> and uh, I can't imagine two more different captain portrayals than Roy Scheider and Michael Ironsides. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Pretty great. <laughs> How did that ever come to pass? Amazing. Well, um, do you want to uh, head to our uh, Priority One inbox and see what's waiting for us in there? Oh, yeah. Let's, let's get these P1s out of the trench. Priority One message from Starfleet coming in on secured channel. Okay, Adam, we got a couple of P1s here. The first one is from Rustin. Hey! It's to Dr. Sam. Rustin! Yeah, we know Rustin. Yeah, we know Rustin from STLV. One of the greats. Goes like this. Sitting scared in the emergency room after sending out a somewhat panicky social media message about having an emergency appendectomy, I got a text. What hospital are you at? And who is your surgeon? It wasn't one of my useless friends and family. It was DCFOD Sam, a real-life surgeon. I had struck up a friendship with at STLV and the DC live show. And uh, this P1 continues on to the next P1. Turns out Sam knew my surgeon and hit him up. I got VIP hospital treatment after that. So thanks, Sam, for answering all my questions and making me feel less scared about my first surgery... And then for not unfriending me, after, in a haze of painkillers, I sent you pictures of my incisions after surgery <laughs> to make sure they were healing properly. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, <laughs> we know Dr. Sam. We know Rustin. I'm glad Rustin got through that okay. I've heard that that is super painful. Really? When uh, when you have uh, an emergency, like when you have the thing that they're like, we got to get the appendix out now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like the um, the appendix about to burst is yeah. the worst. I'm glad you made it through. Okay. I still have mine. Do you have yours? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, oh, I'm rocking. I'm rocking that thing. If I ever need mine removed, I'm going to fly out to DC for that. Yeah, no kidding. I want Dr. Sam up in them guts. Yeah. Darwin want to be there too. <laughs> Darwin bottom out at appendix. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, that's great. That's a that's the kind of FOD friendship I love to hear about. Yeah, really great. Nice one, Doctor Sam, and uh, thanks for supporting Greatest Trek, Rustin. Thanks for being a, a friend of Desoto for a long, long time. Yeah, both of you. If you'd like to get a P1 on the show, it is MaximumFun.org slash Jumbotron to book yours today. We really appreciate it. Helps keep the lights on around here. Hey, Ben. What's that, Adam? Did you find yourself an Edward Larkin? Edward Larkin. Ooh. I noticed at one point in that scene where they're like, we can't fix the virus. Maybe we can go around it. <laughs> Around the dogs? Yeah, around the dogs. This virus has dogs, and they're barking. <laughs> Roy Scheider, like, opens a drawer and is pulling out what I imagine to be, they're supposed to be computer chips, but they look a little bit more like poker chips mm -hmm. <laughs> out of this drawer. Yeah. But they're made out of the same, like, clear plastic that they make isolinear chips out of in Star Trek. And I was like, he is like the Shimoda. He's not even the Edward Larkin. He's the Shimoda of this. He's pulling out the chips. I like an unusual depiction of a future computer. This seems totally unique in that way. Yeah, yeah. Like heavily inspired by Star Trek, but very much its own thing. Yeah. So for that moment, I think uh, I'm going to give it to Captain Bridger, a man who has a name that ensured that he would spend a lot of his life on the bridges of ships. Mine's going to be George Leshien <laughs> for choosing Captain Stark to run his pirate ship mission. Bad choice. I think when you have Stark in the room for that, that job interview, you got to have her figured out. Yeah, She doesn't yeah. seem good in the room. She's not stable. And if she's not good in the room, she shouldn't be running the pirate ship. Did you... when? Captain Bridger fired up the wife hollow at the end. 
it was a little bit blurry. Did you get bumped it, like that he was looking at a image of Captain Stark in a sundress for a second? Kind of feels like uh, <laughs> should Captain Bridger have a type? Maybe Stark <laughs> is that type. I mean, we've said it before on the show, Ben. No one fucks like crazy. And, uh, <laughs> Darwin wants Stark. <laughs> Let me at Stark. <laughs> Where did that escape sub go? Darwin want to know. Stark crazy enough for breath play. <laughs> Plug my hole, mommy. <laughs> Hey, Ben, great idea for this pilot season concept. This one came from you. It was pitched oh. and pitched well. I am excited to continue on on this journey. What is next as we continue on in these uh, first episodes of science fiction shows from this era? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, let me correct you. Wendy and I came up with this together. Oh, yeah. What is clear is I was not involved in any way. Yeah, well, you... <laughs> You just no call, no showed the meeting. So we were like, I guess we got to do this without Adam. That'll happen. I mean, many people said that this next thing was impossible, that it would never happen. Oh, no. But the next pilot that we have on our list. Oh, no. A show that came out same year as this, 1993. The pilot is called Midnight on the Firing Line. It's the pilot of Babylon 5. Oh, God. Really? <laughs> yeah. I really should have gone to that meeting. <laughs> I would have vetoed this, Ben. <laughs> really? Yeah. Can you even watch the, the premiere episode of this? It is on the Roku channel. It's on Tubi, and it is available to rent and buy in a bunch of places. But I think on Roku and Tubi, it's free. Oh, my God. Yeah. I take back all of the praise I had for this pilot season project. You and Wendy fucked up. <laughs> oh, there's a there's a description here. The Narn attack a Centauri colony. Telepath Winters affects Ivanova. Great. <laughs> the Narn. And uh, presumably uh, Bruce Box Puncher is there. So, uh... <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. Really excited for whatever that is. Yeah. Looking forward to it. I think I'm going to no-call, no-show that episode. <laughs> How about new? No? We have one last segment to do here on Greatest Trek. Uh, this is a warning bois. Prepare a buoy and launch it when ready. Warning buoys. An emergency buoy. A warning buoy. It is from our buddy Aaron Waldke on Mastodon. How about that? Aaron Waldke said, It was a delight chatting with Adam Pranica and at Benjamin AHR on at Greatest Trek at friendsofdesoto.social about Star Trek Prodigy Season 1 now on Netflix. And uh, he linked to our show. That was real nice of him. We had such a great time talking to, to Aaron Waldke and uh, I'm hoping we get to spend more time with that guy going forward because yeah, he's great. I'm, I'm glad he wasn't censured or removed from his job <laughs> for being on our show. So far, uh, Aaron Waltke continues to do his work as a free man, unpunished. Yeah, that's great. That's very encouraging. I wasn't so sure. Hey, if you'd uh, like to hear your words coming out of our mouths, make a social media post recommending our show to people. Aaron Waltke even went to the trouble of doing gach.biz slash greatest trek as the link on Mastodon, which is... Uh, that's how you can tell he's a real FOT right there. He really is. Yeah. He knows his stuff. Yeah. So uh, post about the show, recommending it, and uh, Bill might spot that somewhere and put it in front of us, and uh, you can hear your words coming out of our mouths. We'd sure appreciate it. You can see my dolphin penis going into your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Wendy. Uh, take it from here. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Greatest Trek is an Uxbridge Shimoda podcast on the Maximum Fun Network. It's hosted by Ben Harrison and Adam Pranica, and it's produced and edited by Wendy Pretty. Next week on the show, it's Babylon 5, and if you're interested in watching these pilots along with other FODs, head over to the USS Hood Discord at drunkshimoda.com, where you can join weekly watch parties throughout pilot season. 
Thanks to Adam Ragusia, who composed our theme music. You can find his YouTube cooking channel and podcast by searching for Adam Ragusia. Thanks to Nick Dittmore for creating the show art, and thanks to Bill Tilly for managing all of the At Greatest Trek social media pages. As always, we want to thank the Max Fund members who support Greatest Trek on a monthly basis. If you'd like to become a member to help keep this thing going, you can do that at MaximumFun.org slash join. When you do, you get instant access to the entire catalog of bonus content from across the network, including new bonus episodes from Ben and Adam that are coming out every single month. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week on Greatest Trek. Oh, man. Oversexed Darwin. Who knew? (laughs) Maximum Fun. A worker-owned network of artist-owned shows. Supported directly by you.